Hello everyone and welcome back to Decoding Cryptography, a video lecture series where we take a nerdy look at encryption and how it works. Today's material is one of my favorite topics that we cover in this lecture series because we're finally going to get the chance to look at what it takes to do cryptanalysis. And the topics we cover today, I think you'll find are going to be the same topics that we will come back to over and over again when we're discussing the security of an encryption algorithm. Anyway, that's enough dilly-dallying for now. Let's get down to brass tacks and actually look at what we're going to cover today. If you remember from one of our previous videos, we talked about this idea of the effective key length for an encryption algorithm. I think we looked specifically at triple des and single des to look how even though nominally the uh, key length of those algorithms is one thing, they're somewhat shorter in effective security because of certain methods that people developed in order to crack them. Now, we didn't really discuss how they came up with that number, but the truth is that number doesn't just appear out of thin air. What actually happens in practice is that when an algorithm gets published to the world, a bunch of security research teams try their best to crack it and make it appear less secure than it actually is using some clever application of statistics. So really, in many ways, it's a game of back and forth between uh, those designing algorithms and those trying to break algorithms. And that's how the field of research in cryptography is pushed forward and progresses. And so we're going to talk about four categories of cryptanalytics that security teams use in order to break these encryption algorithms. And then we're going to look at how you can actually kind of flip it on its head and use those same techniques in order to design a very secure encryption algorithm. And if we have time at the end, we're also going to discuss one encryption method, or cryptanalytic method, excuse me, called linear cryptanalysis. So the four categories of cryptanalytic techniques that exist are really broken down by what the eavesdropper, Eve, gets when she plays the game with Alice and Bob. And so if you think about it for a second, what we have here is either ciphertext or plaintext. And really, that's it in the choice of whether or not you get to encrypt or decrypt ciphertext or plain text. So knowing this brings us to the first category of cryptanalysis, which is ciphertext only, where Eve only gets access to the ciphertext between Alice and Bob, and Eve has to use this in order to break the encryption algorithm. The second category, kind of similar, is called known plaintext. And what this means is that in addition to getting the ciphertext, Eve actually knows the plaintext for a given ciphertext message. However, Eve does not get to choose what those messages are. This brings us to the third category of attack techniques, which is known as chosen plaintext attack. In this scenario, Eve actually does get to choose the plaintext messages that she wants to encrypt. And from there, she has the message ciphertext pairings. Uh, she can use this in order to find what the algorithm is doing. And then finally, imagine instead of just letting Eve choose the messages that she can encrypt, you can also let her choose the ciphertext messages that she can decrypt. This is known as chosen ciphertext attack. So these are the four categories that we have to work with in terms of cryptanalytic attack techniques. And as you can see, they kind of uh, are ordered in ascending order of the power that Eve has. First, she only has the ciphertext, then she gets the pair, then she gets to choose the pair, and then finally she can actually choose either the ciphertext or the plaintext to encrypt or decrypt. Now I want to focus on these last two uh, categories in particular because this is what we're going to see a lot in the cryptography literature. In the third category, what essentially you're saying is that Eve has access to the encryption oracle, whereas in the fourth category, chosen ciphertext attack, she has access to both the encryption and decryption oracle. Now you might be wondering what an oracle is. Essentially, an oracle, you can think of it as a black box that Eve gets access to. Eve doesn't get to know what, the, what it looks like inside that black box, but Eve can send queries to that black box and get outputs. And so, for example, if Eve had access to what is called a random oracle, then any query that she makes to the random oracle will output a random value. And actually, what you'll see is that when we design encryption algorithms, what we're trying to achieve is this random oracle pattern, because it means that it's a patternless output of ciphertext that Eve cannot use in order to decrypt. Also, it should be mentioned that in the random oracle model, if you keep querying the same request over and over again, it's going to give you the same result. So 
it's not truly random in the sense that you're going to get a random result every single time, even for the same requests. Okay, let's actually get into designing these crypto systems using uh, these methods of crypto analytic techniques that we've seen. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to create what are called games. But before I get into the games for categories three and four, I want to talk about a concept in security called semantic security. And it's, a, in my opinion, a bit of a vague notion. The idea is generally this. You have an attacker, and the attacker, for any security system, will only gain neg negligible information about that plain text from the ciphertext. And so we've kind of seen, we've beat around the bush in terms of discussing what this topic means, but I just wanted to put a name to it because you're going to see it being tossed around a lot in cryptography. I've also seen a couple other definitions for it. The reason I'm bringing this up is because there's kind of, I think, a little bit disagreement. Like, for example, in the symmetric encryption setting, uh, what semantic security means is that the attacker is given a pair of plain text messages and a pair of ciphertext messages, and the attacker cannot actually distinguish or map, I guess, uh, one plain text message to its corresponding ciphertext message and the same for the other. And I've also seen that this is different in terms of asymmetric encryption. Um, so I'm just throwing it out there because there's a lot of different definitions of semantic security and something that's worth considering in the future. Now, for this first definition that I've given in terms of the symmetric encryption setting, this looks a lot like what's called a security against the known plaintext attack. You're given a bunch of plain text and ciphertext pairs, and you have to determine whether or not you can break that system. However, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of disagreement about the definition. I've also seen someone discuss semantic security in the context of ciphertext in indistinguishability, which is what that term is called, uh, in the setting of known, or not known, sorry, uh, chosen plain text attack, which is category three, not category two, like mentioned above. Now that we've discussed semantic security, let's move on to the more interesting discussions of CPA and CCA security and how we design games to demonstrate those two security properties. First, let's talk about the CPA game. So we're going to take off our Alice, Bob, and Eve hat for a second and talk about two players in this game. First is an attacker, denoted in script A, and a challenger. And the attacker is going to be given access to the encryption oracle. Step one in the game is this. The attacker is going to send a pair of plain text messages, P0 and P1, to the encryption oracle. Step two, the challenger is going to randomly select a bit B from either 0 or 1. So this is essentially like flipping the coin. Step three, the attacker is going to receive back a ciphertext for that bit B. It's either going to be 0 or 1. And then on step four, they're going to guess what they think that bit that was selected was based on what they got back. Finally, in step five, if they select the correct bit, then they win, and if they select the incorrect bit, then they lose. And so when we talk about CPA security, what we really mean is that the attacker is going to win this game only half of the time. And I want to emphasize this. It has to be half of the time. It cannot be either significantly less than that or significantly more than that, because that would denote a pattern. If the attacker wins this game more than half the time, that means they know something about the encryption algorithm they can use to crack it. And if they lost more than half the time, then they also know something. It's just in the opposite direction. They know exactly that they should be going against their intuition. If you want to relax this constraint so that it's not exactly one half, you can add some sort of epsilon that's a very small number, and that kind of gives you a relaxed constraint for CPA security. Okay, I'm going to do a more formal and more deliberate recap of what I just said. And I'm going to go slowly so we absorb what's happening. What we have here is an encryption scheme. And that encryption scheme is going to have a key generation function, an encryption algorithm, and a decryption algorithm. Now, that encryption scheme is CPA secure if, for all pairs of plain text messages, the little upside down A means for all here, by the way, such that they are of equal length, because they need to be equal length or else the challenger will, or the, sorry, the attacker will just trivially solve this problem. 
for all efficient attackers, and efficient here means that the attacker can call the encryption and decryption oracle for arbitrary plain text a polynomially bounded number of times. And the same thing they can do operations such as decryption operations a polynomially bounded number of times. Anyway, if any given attacker that's efficient is given any pair of messages that are of equal length and they have access to the encryption oracle and what they receive in return is the ciphertext for both C0 and C1 for those messages, then the algorithm is CPA secure if they pick M0 or M1 an equal number of times. And this kind of makes sense because here we're talking about them winning the game half the time and each bit is only getting picked half the time. So between step three and four, I didn't really mention this, but between step three and four, the attacker can make any sort of number of arbitrary queries to the encryption oracle. And they can also perform any number of operations that they want to, so long as those operations are polynomially bounded. And so this is, uh, I'm not really going to get into the idea of computational complexity here, but the point of this is just to kind of relax the constraint and tell us that the algorithm is still CPA secure if within a reasonable time frame, the attacker still wins the game only half the time. When a scheme is CPA secure, one of the terms you'll hear thrown around is called ciphertext indistinguishability under the chosen plain text attack game. And the abbreviation for this is INDCPA. So if you ever come across that acronym, that's what that means. Now that we've discussed the CPA game, which is category three, we're gonna discuss two variants of the category four game, which is known as the CCA game. The first flavor of the CCA game that we're going to discuss is called CCA1, which is indifferent chosen cipher text attack. And CCA1 is really no different from CPA, with the exception that the attacker will also get the access to the decryption oracle, and they can send as many queries as they want in a reasonable amount of time to that oracle as well, all the way up until they receive their cipher text challenge back from the challenger at which point they will no longer have access to the decryption oracle. So let's go back and talk about those steps. Step one, the attacker is going to send an arbitrary number of queries to the encryption and decryption oracles that they're given access to. Step two, the attacker is going to send a plain text pair, M1 and M0, to the challenger to be encrypted, and they have to be the same length. Step three, the challenger is going to pick a bit B from 0 and 1 uniformly and at random, so a flip of the coin. Step 4, the attacker is going to receive back the ciphertext that the challenger decided to encrypt using bit B, and the, the attacker is going to perform any other additional operations in polynomial time that are not queries to the decryption oracle. Step 5, the attacker is going to output what they think the bit B that was selected is, and they'll win if they get, were correct. So once again, let's talk about what it takes to be CCA1 secure this time. An encryption scheme is going to be CCA1 secure, also known as IND CCA1, if for all plain text pairs such that they are of equal length, once again, for all efficient attackers, so just to reiterate, all pairs of equal length plain text messages challenged against all efficient attackers means that each attacker, given access to the encryption and decryption oracle and receiving back a ciphertext 0 or a ciphertext 1, they will pick either option with about the same probability. And so this is a nice starting point, but we can actually strengthen it a little bit by giving the attacker access to the decryption oracle after it receives back C sub B. And this is what the CCA2 game essentially does. And so we're gonna keep the same conditions as before, except this time that decryption 
oracle will still be in use to the attacker, so they can make as many decryption queries as they want. However, the stipulation is that they can't actually decrypt the message itself. They can decrypt a part of the ciphertext message itself, but they can't decrypt C sub B itself. And so CCA2 is going to be what's called adaptive chosen ciphertext attack. And this is what you're going to see more often because this is the requirement that many security researchers try to achieve when they're designing an encryption scheme. So one last time, let's look at the steps of CCA2. As you can see, it's going to look a lot like CCA1 with the exception of step 4, where you include additional queries to anything that's not C sub B. I think that's a good stopping point for today. I don't think I'm going to get into linear cryptanalysis in this video because it's already gone on for a little bit too long. So as a recap, we covered the four categories of cryptanalysis that generally exist. We also discussed three games that belong to categories three and four of those techniques known as CPA, CCA1, and CCA2 security. And then we, we missed, unfortunately, discussing linear cryptanalysis, and so we'll save that for another time. And we also are in a different video, and probably in that same video, actually, we're going to discuss differential cryptanalysis, and we'll see those, how those two compare. In our next video, however, we're going to return to symmetric encryption, and we're going to talk about how we can use block ciphers for any arbitrary message length. And we're going to have to talk about two techniques. First is modes of operation, and the second is what's called reversible length extension. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks for watching this video. Please leave any recommendations that you have in the comments or just message me personally. Until then, this is Decoding Cryptography.